density sort of plateaus at around age 30. So the most dense your bones will ever be is when you're about 30 years old. It kind of varies depending on the person and risk factors, but that's on average when we're gonna have the most bone density. And then as we age, especially in women, we tend to lose bone density as we approach nearer and nearer to menopause. So um, we see um, those secondary problems that are happening from osteoporosis fractures and, and issues like that happening as, as we get closer to um, or in, in menopause and then farther away, like in the 60s and 70s primarily. Um, so the risk factors for osteoporosis, there's modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors. So our modifiable um, risk factors will go into the things that are out of our control are things like our sex. So females are a higher risk of osteoporosis than males, um, our age. So again, as we approach menopause and in our, you know, as we age, we're at higher risk. Some races are at higher risk for menopause, such as Caucasians and Asians. Um, also our family history. So if you have a, a parent or a sibling who has had a major osteoporotic uh, fracture, such as a hip fracture or a compression fracture of the lumbar spine, you're at a higher risk of getting osteoporosis. And then also body frame size. So people with a smaller body frame tend to have a higher risk of osteoporosis. Uh, some of the modifiable risk factors for, for osteoporosis include our hormone levels. So um, they're sort of, you can't really modify them that it's inevitable that we're all gonna decline as far as our hormone status, but those are things that we can replenish. Um, so hormone levels such as estrogen deficiency and testosterone deficiency, and then thyroid problems, adrenal dysfunction, things like that can also set you up for osteoporosis. Another modifiable um, risk factor is low dietary calcium, um, some eating disorders, so especially um, the caloric restricti restrictive eating disorders, and then gastric bypass is also another risk factor for uh, osteoporosis. Uh, some medications are set you up for a higher risk, so uh, glucocorticosteroids, some chemotherapies, some seizure medications, these can also increase your risk. And then um, certain medical problems, such as celiac disease, um, L L other malabsorptive um, disorders such as inflammatory or irritable bowel. Um, and there's some other cancers and, and other um, medical problems that can increase your risk. But where we're gonna focus primarily is on our lifestyle choices. So we know that sedentary lifestyles increase your risk of thinning bones. Um, also excessive alcohol use and tobacco use are other lifestyle issues that can increase your risk. So a screening for osteoporosis. So we need to know, you know, we kind of start there. Do you have it? Do you not have it? Looking at your risk factors. So if somebody came into my office and with this concern, do I have osteoporosis? What are my risk factors? So we would go through those risk factors that we talked about and then consider ordering what's called a DEXA scan or a bone density test. So what a DEXA scan does, it's sort of a series of x-rays that looks at the, usually the femoral, um, the femoral head, like the big bone in the hip and also the lumbar spine. So it uses that image to calculate the bone mineral density in that segment of bone. And then it gives you sort of a score. So I, it's not gonna come through very well, but this is sort of what, uh, what a bone density report will look like. So you'll see sort of, this is like a lumbar spine. This is a, a femoral head. You can Google this and you'll see it in a better image, but you'll see the report will come back in the green, yellow, or red. So um, the green is normal, yellow is osteopenia, and red is osteoporosis. So when you go through that report with your primary care doctor or your rheumatologist or whomever ordered the test, they can look at the score that you were given and look at your risk factors that are specific and for you and sort of give you a, a recommendation as far as treatment. So um, 
if you have true osteoporosis where a, your T score, which that's what uh, the, the um, bone density will sort of be reported as is a T score. And if that T score is in that osteoporotic range, um, your primary care doctor or whomever will usually recommend some sort of treatment. Um, we also use what's called a FRAX score, F-R-A-X, and you can Google that as well. And you can even go through if you have your, if you've done a bone density test, um, you can go through and click in your own risk factors. It'll just go through a little questionnaire where it asks your age, your previous fracture, if you've had that history, any history of gluto glucocorticoid therapy, such as steroids or um, chemotherapies, things like that. If you have any, so we'll go through those risk factors and you can kind of click through it. And if you know your T-score, if you've had that bone density study, you can calculate your FRAX score, which the FRAX score gives us a sort of a 10-year risk assessment on what is your risk over the next 10 years of having a major osteoporotic fracture. And so with that score, um, a lot of times we'll use that score just to guide our management and guide our uh, recommendations to our patients. Should this person, should this patient consider being on a um, bisphosphonate medication or other type of treatment for, um, for osteoporosis? Um, so the treatments that we have for osteoporosis, they're primarily um, the kind of first line are bisphosphonates. So if you've heard of medications like Boniva, Reclast, um, those are typical bisphosphonate medications. There's also monoclonal antibody medications that are used like Prolia, hormone therapy such as estrogen, testosterone, things like that. And then there's also parathyroid uh, analogs such as Forteo. But those are medications that you know, we, we would look at um, your history, your T-score, your risk assessment, and guide our um, management strategy based on, on those, those factors. So moving on to um, prevention, which is sort of my area that I like to spend the most time because we want to catch these things before they become an issue, right? So now is the time to really start dialing in on these prevention strategies to really make sure that we keep our bones healthy as we age. And as Kaya fit females, we wanna make sure that we're able to do the things that we wanna do. The whole premise behind Kaya is functional training, right? And that essentially means like you can take the garbage out and you can you know, climb up the ladder and paint your wall if you want to. It's, these are functional, um, exercises that keep us active and healthy as we age. So it's not just about our gene size, it's about keeping our bodies active and keeping ourselves as independent as possible and as strong as possible from now until we die, right? So that's, that's the whole idea behind um, looking at these risk factors. So as primary care, you know, I look at things that are modifiable and how do we, how do we help enhance somebody's wellness and enhance somebody's lifestyle to make it as likely as possible that they can, you know, um, achieve all the goals that you want to in your life. So if it's to travel or to, you know, ride your bike 50 miles or whatever it is, the prevention is, is key. So we want to catch these things before they slow you down. So the lifestyle measures that should be adopted universally, I think, um, to prevent osteoporosis, not just for you know women. I think this is a these are good things for everybody to to adopt. But primarily, if, if you especially if you're concerned or if you have a risk factor for osteoporosis, um, which in this group looking at the you know and Kaya, it's like it's all women, right? So we all have we are all at risk. So these are things that we all need to adopt and make sure that we're paying attention to. Um, so calcium and vitamin D are the, are the supplements that we primarily kind of think about when we think about bone mineral loss. And that's because those osteoclasts and osteoblasts utilize calcium 
and vitamin D as a receptor to kind of build that bony matrix. So calcium, there's sort of controversy around calcium and as, as far as should we, should we suggest or advise calcium supplementation because there has been some uh, report of a possible increase in cardiovascular disease risk. So there's been some uh, reports that have shown maybe an association between calcium supplementation and specifically MI or myocardial infarction or heart attack. So there, the thinking is that maybe that high levels or, or extra calcium supplementation can kind of lay down calcium deposits in the coronary arteries. So again, it's just an association and we don't really know for sure. But what we do know is that those associations sort of disappear when the supplementation is less than a thousand milligrams. So that's kind of usually what I tell my patients is that the best way to get calcium is through your diet. So if you can really try to focus in on a plant-based whole foods diet that's rich in calcium, just naturally, that's the best way that your body will absorb it and you won't get those potential side effects, those cardiovascular side effects. If you are not good at you know, eating your calcium rich foods or you know that you know, you're just you know, kind of fall short in that way, and I do have some patients who are like, I'm just not going to eat that way. You know, I just, that's just not, I will try, but I'd rather take a supplement just to know for sure. So I think that that's reasonable, but you would just want to keep that supplement and your dietary calcium below that 1000 milligrams for the supplement, because you don't want to kind of get up into those higher ranges, just in case there is an association between cardiovascular risk and calcium supplementation. Um, so the bottom line, dietary calcium has not been shown to increase cardiovascular disease risk. It's only supplemental. And um, in fact, they've actually shown an inverse relationship with cardiovascular disease and calcium rich diets. So again, it's dietary calcium that is inversely related and the, the calcium supplementation is just the one that you kind of need to be mindful of and not go above that 1000 milligrams. And just as an aside note, I, I will send out um, sort of show notes that will kind of outline the things that we've talked about. So you don't have to write down the numbers if you don't want to, I'll, I'll send those out to you. Um, the next thing is vitamin D, which is so important. And it's something that I would say probably upwards to 80 to 90% of the patients that I check, their vitamin D levels are either like, low normal or deficient. And I think the reason is because we, you know, when we are out in the sun, which is our primary source, the dermal synthesis from the sun is our kind of our primary source of vitamin D. But when we go outside, we, you know, we lather ourselves with sunscreen, rightly so, it's good for our skin, you know, it's, we wanna make sure that we're protecting from skin cancer, but it also can set us up for vitamin D deficiencies. Um, there's also vitamin D fortified foods, but we really, know that most people need a supplement. Um, so the Institute of Medicine, when you look at the recommendations for vitamin D, it's about 800 IUs. In my practice, I typically will recommend a little bit higher of a dose, like 2000 IUs. And the reason is because I've seen over time in patients who have like a subpar vitamin D and I've recommended that 800, it really just doesn't pull them up to the levels that we wanna see. So um, I, I usually recommend a little bit higher of a dose there. And the reason that vitamin D is so important um, for osteoporosis is because vitamin D sort of acts like a receptor. So it, it helps your bone sort of see the calcium that's around and it helps absorb it and it helps process it. So if you don't have enough vitamin D, it doesn't matter how much calcium you're taking in, you're not gonna use it as readily. Your body's not gonna be able to metabolize it as well as if you have that vitamin D on board as well. Um, so it really is important for osteoporosis, but sort of the extra skeletal benefits, there's a lot of other, other benefits of vitamin D than just osteoporosis. So this is a um, really become more of a, Kind of a hotter topic since COVID, you know, they've found that um, some patients with vitamin D deficiencies are doing more 
they're, they're getting more severe cases of, of COVID than patients with a normal vitamin D. And it hasn't really panned out across the board. So again, it's an association, not causation. But there was one um, really interesting study that occurred that they ran out of a uh, hospital in Spain. And there were 70, you know, around 70 to 80 hospitalized patients for, they were hospitalized due to COVID re related respiratory issues. And they randomly assigned them for a vitamin D supplement and then a group that didn't get vitamin D supplement and they all got the standard COVID treatment. And then it, so after this study, they found that the patients that were assigned to the vitamin D cohort actually required fewer ICU admissions. So it was 2% in the vitamin D group versus 50% in the non-vitamin D group, which was pretty remarkable. So that's become sort of standard of care. We don't really know for sure why. We think it's because vitamin D helps enhance the immune system, but we don't know the specifics regarding that. But I've been telling patients like, start taking vitamin D now, like our whole, our everybody's mind is on COVID. So really trying to just set your body up for the best chance to, if you were to get it, to fight it and be able to, to make it through as unscathed as possible. And I think vitamin D is key in that. Um, there's also been some associations between vitamin D and hypertension, cardiovascular disease. Um, there've been some studies about type one diabetes. And so supplementing babies and kids with type one diabetes has shown maybe an decreased risk of type one diabetes. And they, again, I think it goes back to that immune mediated response. So. Um, it's important for kids to especially solely breastfed babies. Um, so type two diabetes as well, it's shown some improvement with that. It's also decreased risk in certain types of cancers. It's been shown to be helpful with depression. So sort of a, a strong, you know, wide array of things that vitamin D can be helpful for. So I think it's an important one that we all put in our medicine cabinet and that we're taking on, on a daily basis. Um, so going back to the other preventive care strategies for osteoporosis, diet is the next one that we're going to talk about. So really, um, we sort of hit on it already is just a diet that's high in naturally occurring calcium. So um, there's really been no specific diet that's tailored to osteoporosis other than that, unless you have something like celiac disease where we know that if you have celiac disease, going on a gluten-free diet does help prevent osteoporosis. But otherwise, it's really um, just trying to be more whole foods, plant-based, and really trying to um, make sure that you're getting that 1,200 milligrams of dietary calcium every day. Um, and then moving on to exercise, this is a big thing that I talk about a lot, <laughs> and we're getting a little... Uh, <laughs> excitement from Nick there, but this is a this is really a important prevention strategy for osteopenia and osteoporosis because we know that I mean, study after study shows that exercise will help prevent thinning of the bones as we age, and it's interesting. You know, we, you know, when I was training in medical school, we were always taught that weight bearing exercise, you know, the sort of pounding from jogging or, you know, um, brisk walking, those were the types of, of exercises that were the most um, efficacious in decreasing that risk. But now that we've, we've seen more studies showing that actually it's the combination of resistance-based training and those um, weight bearing exercises, those are the, that combination is, is, has been shown to be the most effective. So really Kaya based workouts, right? That's what we do in Kaya. So it's the combination of resistance training, weight bearing exercises. Those are the most effective in increasing your bone mineral density. So there's been studies that have shown that, um, you know, that the, weight bearing and not weight bearing are the most effective and it, it increases the bone mineral density but also decreases your fracture risk because it helps 
you know, that, that sort of core functional training helps balance. It helps you be able to get up off the floor easily, more easily. It helps, you know, just um, that functional moving around throughout your day that will help, you know, um, prevent falls. Those all things that, that coordinated over the course of your life, you know, the women that we see or the patients that we see getting these major osteoporotic fractures, they're not active. They, you know, they just have a little trip and end up falling down. So Kaya is really great at that. It's like, it helps to kind of keep your balance up, keep your core strength up, keep your agility. And so that's the kind of combined training and the programs that really have shown to decrease the risk of, of osteoporosis, just bone mineral density in and of itself, but also the fracture risk. So both of those things combined. Um, so the, the last thing that I wanted to just emphasize was that I'm gonna just kind of go over my preventive care strategies just one more time. Um, to make sure that, you know, we're looking at all of those, those modifiable risk factors. So you can't change your DNA, you can't change your parents, you can't change your, your race or your age, but the things that you can change are the food that you're eating, the supplements that you're being mindful of, the exercise that you're doing, and really, um, focusing in on those modifiable factors that will keep you healthy and active and thriving as you age. So calcium, you know, dietary calcium, vitamin D, plant-based whole foods, calcium rich diet, and plenty of workouts, Kaya Fit and strength and resistance and running and all those things to keep you, keep you going. I think that's all I had. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was like, I have tons and tons of notes and I'd love to answer any questions. So if you guys have any questions, you can type in, um, you can also unmute yourself. Um, one thing that I wanted to ask is like, what are kind of like the biggest, like bang for your buck as far as foods? Like, I know it's like almond and spinach and dandelion and bok choy, but like, what are your favorite go-tos as far as like uh, plant-based calcium rich foods. Yeah. So those are my, those are the big ones that you, that you sort of mentioned already. So almond milks, almonds, like those big leafy, dark leafy greens. So the Swiss chard and kale and those types of, of dark leafy veggies are kind of the, my big go-tos. So sometimes like patients will say, oh, I, I don't like to eat those like Swiss chard, like who eats Swiss chard or kale's disgusting or whatever. So I get all these sorts of like, you know, um, barriers to dietary calcium in the office. And so I, I, a lot of times will say, you know, even in the morning, if you can make yourself a good green smoothie, so putting like a half of a banana, a couple of handfuls of, you know, frozen berries and ice, and then a big handful of spinach or kale and, and, you know, a good protein powder, that's a great way to like start your day off with a mineral calcium rich food that will, you know, kind of cross off all of those, um, you know, those supplements right, right from the get go, right from the morning. I also put a lemon uh, sometimes in my smoothie because I've heard that it helps break down the cells in the spinach and helps that you absorb your calcium a little mm -hmm. more effectively. Yeah, that's true. Iron too. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so we've got some questions coming in. And um, so the First, so Vicki had two questions. So is stress a factor and does medication help with prevention? So I think her first question was, is there any side effects of the medications? And I'm assuming that was probably when you listed like the, the initial medications. Mm -hmm. And then the second follow-up question was, is stress a factor? And then does medication help with prevention? Yeah, so those are all great questions. So as far as side effects from the medications, there's side effects for every medication. So that's definitely a yes. So you have to weigh the risk and benefit for yourself and you know your doctor or your provider will help you kind of weigh that out. 
Um, so the primary side effects or, or concerns that we have for bisphosphonates specifically, because those are the first line medications, are osteonecrosis of the jaw. So if you're ever going to get any dental work, your dentist really needs to know that you're on those medications because it can delay healing. Um, it can actually you know, in rare instances, cause fractures. So um, there's, you know, you have to take some of these medications on an empty stomach and stay upright because they can be really erosive to the lining of your stomach. So you really just have to be mindful of, of those potential side effects and um, the medications, you know, for it, like, again, it's really patient specific. So it's a risk benefit for every medication that I ever prescribe. Is it is the risk, um, does it outweigh the benefit or does the benefit outweigh the risk? And so you really have to kind of take those things into consideration is when, when deciding, do I want to take it or do I not, you know? Great. Um, and I'm sorry, I, I misread her second question. So the first one, you answered it perfectly is the side effects. And then the second one was, um, does meditation help with prevention? Oh, so no. is stress a factor and then does meditation help? So. I mean, I think medica medication, medication, now I'm saying medication instead of medication. I did the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think meditation helps with everything because it helps us put our mind in a more balanced place to serve our wellness, right? So if we're, um, our goal is to exercise and to, you know, get our foundation solid to where we're setting ourselves up for the best, you know, strategy for get, you know, keeping well as we age. I think that only comes from paying attention to yourself and to sit quiet with yourself and say, okay, what are my priorities? You know, how do I support those priorities? How do I support those goals? And um, I think meditation just really helps to bring it back and center yourself and say, yeah, you know, like, um, how do I, how do I support myself and make sure that I'm making a commitment and, and a habit to supporting my wellness? And I think meditation helps with, with that in so many ways. Right. And I also, like I heard you mention earlier is like, if our, our, if our, and this is, we can't have too much of a conversation on this because we could talk about this forever, but when, when our adrenals are taxed and then it, it starts uh, wreaking havoc on our hormones, then that comes into play with our bone density. And so it's like, it's all a beautiful symphony or orchestra. And mm -hmm. if we can decrease our stress, then our hormones are, affected in a positive way by mm -hmm. that parasympathetic nervous system calming ourselves. And then we're building that, like you said, healthy habits that really like all play together in one. Yeah, um, it's all interconnected, you know? So if you're stressed out in your life, you're not going to be as likely to say, to make a good choice as far as your diet or make a good choice, say, I'm going to go exercise instead of crack open a bottle of wine and take a glass of wine, you know? So I think if we're making decisions from a more balanced and centered place, we're going to make decisions that support our wellness versus like knee jerk reactions or, or stress-based decisions that don't always fall in line with our wellness goals. Um, so Angela uh, wanted to know if you have a recommendation for vitamin D, but why don't we just um, take a link and we'll put it into the show notes on Facebook. And then we'll do like a, a thank you email for you guys. And then like um, Amy had the show notes too. So we'll put that in there for you, Angela. And then Steph had something that might be a bigger conversation, but maybe you could hit it quickly because I do have to jump off in like five minutes. Um, but what about dairy um, and calcium intake? So her question was like, what about the dairy and calcium? Yeah, so I, I I really try to stay away from, you know, pushing vegan in my practice because I think a lot of patients will cut off and say, I can't do that and stop listening to me, you know? So I think that, you know, I try to promote plant-based eating as much as possible and say, 
you know, as much as you can eat as many plants as you can. And if you're going to have dairy and meat, you know, do it in moderation, but the calcium, you know, what, how most people get their dietary calcium is through dairy products. So if you're going to eat dairy, it's a fine source of calcium, but just make sure that it's high quality, you know, so you're doing, you know, grass fed organic when you can, um, and getting your calcium that way, I think is, is, is fine. But again, um, just making sure it's, it's a high quality. My preference is definitely plant-based, but I think that, um, by focusing on that primarily, you know, a lot of people will sort of like shut off and say, I'm not, I'm not going to ever be vegan, you know? So just to, to get my message out there to as mo many people as possible, I think that, you know, if you're going to do dairy, do it in moderation and do high quality. And it is, it is a, you know, a good source of calcium still, it's better than a supplement. So if you're going to, you know, I'd rather you get dietary calcium in and through a high quality source than, a, than if getting no dietary calcium and taking a supplement. Right. And I think that most of us um, in general have lactose issues. And so I think that that's where that the, the calcium in dairy sometimes is harder for us to absorb because we have other issues that are going on and it creates like stomach issues and all of this. So if you're thinking about your calcium, it's so great to really think about like the sweet potatoes, edamame, kale, like you said, all the leafy greens, the tomatoes, the spinach, there's so many things that we can really absorb through a good handful of leafy greens. Um, mm -hmm. But when you're thinking about, when you're thinking about your calcium, try to think first about like the, all the greens, because there's no, uh, adverse kind of side effects that might, that might be happening because of, of our, um, most of us of that intolerance of, of the lactose or. Yeah. I mean, if you have an issue with absorption, if you have, you know, GI side effects from, from dairy, I think that's in and of itself, a reason to not eat it. It's your body telling you something, you know, but if you don't and you tolerate it fine, um, again, just making sure that it's, it's the most high quality that you can, that you can find and that you can, that you can take in. Okay, great. And so I'm sorry, you guys, I'm going to have to get going because I've got my workout right here, but we're going to answer these questions for you in a handout. So the optimal amount of daily calcium, I know you said take less than a thousand milligrams if you're taking a supplement mm -hmm. and what is kind of, and I know it's different because we're all different sizes and we're all yeah. different, you know, there's so much, there's so many different, like, uh, yeah, in general for, for everybody, it's about 1200 milligrams total of dietary, of dietary calcium. So that's kind of your target. Great. And it, you're right. It does, it does change depending on if you have, you know, medical problems or, you know, you can look, you can look online and, you know, find one that a number that's more tailored to you specifically, but in general, 1200 is a pretty good target for most people. Okay, great. And then the, the last, and I don't know if this is going to be um, too long, but if you, if you're prone to kidney stones, should you be concerned about too much calcium? And that's, yes, yeah, you should. So you should not be, you know, you should definitely try to get most of your calcium in through your diet and not take supplemental calcium because that definitely can exacerbate kidney stones for sure. Okay. Well, thank you, Aim, so much. Thanks so you much guys. for having me, you guys. Wow. I hope you guys got enough out of it and we'll send out the, the show notes and I'll try to be specific about um, some of the vitamin D and the supplements that I use at, in our home and, um, you know, the, the different recommendations as far as how much and um, I'll send that all to Nick and then she can send it out to, to whomever is interested. So thank you so much for having me, you guys. Have Thanks, a great day. Aim. We learned so much. If you guys want a little bone density workout right now, you've got <laughs> the best for that. Get, get your sneakers on. We're going to have a lot of fun. I hope to see you guys at uh, 9 a.m. every Friday. Um, we'll have AIM on uh, for lots more. So everybody's saying thanks. Love you. Uh, and we will see you guys soon. Bye. Bye, guys. Have a great weekend. Bye.